Welcome and thank you everyone for attending this recorded webinar today. Bienvenue and merci de nous rejoindre aujourd'hui. As there is simultaneous French interpretation for this webinar, I'm going to explain in French how to access that. Cette session est disponible avec une interprétation simultanée. La chaîne française est disponible en cliquant sur l'icône du globe située dans la barre inférieure de votre écran. Écran de Zoom et en sélectionnant la chaîne de la langue française. Si vous avez des questions, n'hésitez pas à les poser dans la boîte de discussion. My name is Saba Aslani, and I'm a bilingual knowledge mobilization specialist with Research Impact Canada, housed in York University. And we are so excited to be bringing this webinar to you in partnership with Ontario Shores Center for Mental Health Sciences and the Rideau Ottawa Valley Learning Network on behalf of the Future Skills Center. I am also joined by a few RIC team members, Liz and Sandy, and our French interpreter, Jimmy, who will be helping throughout the presentation. Before introducing our speakers, there are just a few housekeeping items to go over. This webinar is part of our professional development toolbox series to provide tools and resources to the skills and workforce development sector. You will receive a follow-up email after the webinar with access to resources mentioned during the session. We kindly request that you send your questions in the chat box. To ensure a smooth flow and save time, if we are unable to address all the questions at the end of the live session, we will respond to them via email after the webinar. We will begin with an introduction, followed by the first presentation, then the second presentation, and then to wrap up, we'll engage you with a few poll questions to gather your valuable feedback on today's experience. And now to the land acknowledgement. As we are meeting virtually and not all gathered in the same space, we recognize that this land acknowledgement might not be for the territory that you are currently on. As for us here at REC, led by York University, we recognize our presence on the area known as Tegorando, which has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Bennett, and the Metis. We also acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wonton Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. And now to housekeeping items. So while I'm going over some items, please feel free to share in the chat box what are your goals of joining today's webinar. In terms of housekeeping, there is simultaneous French interpretation for this webinar. We also have enabled closed captioning where you will see English subtitles on the bottom of your screen. You can access that by pressing on the live transcript button. We will be recording this webinar and yes, it will be made available on Research Impact Canada's website within a week. And now without further ado, it's with great pleasure to introduce our two expert presenters for today. Our first guest speaker, Dr. Lauren David, is a clinical and health psychologist and an expert in motivational interviewing. Lauren currently works as the regional clinical and training lead with the Ontario Structured Psychotherapy Program at Ontario Shores Center for Mental Health Sciences. Lauren will provide an insightful introduction to the concept of motivational interviewing, a powerful technique for facilitating behavioral change. Building upon the foundation laid by Lauren, it's now my pleasure to introduce our second expert who will delve into the practical applications and benefits of motivational interviewing in the workforce development and skills training sector. Our second speaker, Lisa, is the executive director of the Rideau Ottawa Valley Learning Network. Lisa has advanced level motivational interviewing among her credentials. She will share her insights on using motivational interviewing to approach adults with literacy and employment challenges. And with that, Lauren, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Sava. I really appreciate it. 
It's such a pleasure to be here um, with Research Impacts Canada, and I can't thank them enough for inviting me to come, and I can't thank enough of all almost 200 of you for being interested in this topic uh, and, joining, and joining this presentation. So we'll just wait a second for the slides to come up here. All right, wonderful. So um, as Ava mentioned, I am a psychologist. Uh, working in the field of mental health. So it might be slightly different context from, from some of you watching today, but I think it'll be great to give you, um, you know, just a, a bit of an introduction to what ambivalence is, how you might be able to spot it um, with what you're doing in your work, um, what motivational is and isn't, and then really getting into, you know, the meat and potatoes, the, the spirit of MI, how we would be able to, you um, capture, like tweak our language a little bit in order to incorporate motivational interviewing, as well as some specific strategies you might be able to use. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. And thank you, Sabah, did such a beautiful land acknowledgement, but I figured that um, because I'm in a very specific region and I would do one specific to myself, I am located in um, Tecoronto or Toronto, uh, and I acknowledge that these lands are homes to many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. It's now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Uh, the city is covered by Treaty 13 and Williams Treaties. And as a settler and visitor myself, I'm grateful for the opportunity to meet here with you all. And I thank all the generations of Indigenous peoples who were and continue to be stewards of this land as they have been for thousands of years. I recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to Turtle Island. All right, we can go on to the next slide. So here's what we're here to talk about. So this motivational interviewing or MI as I might call it was developed by Miller and Rolnick. Uh, so these two are actually mental health clinicians working in the field of substance use disorders. So that's really where this all comes from. Um, and I was grateful to read their second edition when I was in my master's. So I learned how to do motivational interviewing before I even learned how to do therapy. And I can tell you, it has served me so well. Um, I feel like it's almost like a second way of talking to, you know, second way of talking to people. So um, we'll go to the next slide. So let's talk about ambivalence about change and feel free to open, uh, put on the next pieces. Perfect. So ambivalence about changing really is simultaneously wanting and not wanting something. So I think most people in the virtual room here would appreciate that we've also had these moments of I want to get up and be productive and I also definitely do not want to get up early and be productive. Um, it also could be wanting to incompatible things. Um, and so ambivalence about change is a really human experience. It's something that we would anticipate many people to have. Um, and I especially see this all the time in psychology. Um, people who you might assume because they're in my office and they're, you know, they're presenting for treatment that they might be ready. Um, but truly it's um, more so, you know, that they might have some reasons to be here, but also have some reasons not to be, you know, not wanting to move forward or to make changes. So how we might recognize ambivalence about change is that you might hear two different types of talk. Um, and this is what Miller and Rolnick discuss in their book. By the way, I really recommend the book if, if motivational interviewing is something you want to continue with. So one is change talk. So when you hear someone talking or using language, that kind of favors change or self-motivational statements. It might be something like, oh, I don't know what I'm gonna do if I can't figure something out in the next two years. That would be a good example of change talk because they're saying something has to change. On the other hand, there's also sustained talk. This would be language that actually favors keeping the status quo or not changing. Now, what I love so much about the third edition of motivational interviewing is they, they've used the word sustained talk as opposed to um, language like resistance or non-compliance, which might be some of the language that, you know, that we're used to hearing or used to thinking about when it comes to wanting to maintain the status quo. And what's really nice about the idea of sustained talk is that if you think about resistance, it almost has this negative connotation to it this sense of, um, you know, that they're resisting and they're not wanting to do what they're supposed to do. 
sustained talk, I think really honors the fact that um, there are probably really good reasons why change is hard for someone. You know, behaviors usually fulfill our needs or desires in some ways, even if they're also hurting us in some way. Um, so you think of something like cigarette smoking, I guess, technically, we know that we're not supposed to be doing it. Um, but, you know, this idea that there's also probably some really good reasons that why we're doing it. Um, and so I really like that they're honoring the very good reasons why people might be staying the same or not making the change. And that would be one of my, my biggest messages to you all on this call is we want to go looking for the good reasons on both sides of the ambivalence because they're there on both sides. Um, so just because there are lots of amazing, really important reasons to change doesn't mean that the reasons that they're not changing are less valid or are not as important. They're kind of equally as important. So what's really interesting, and I just saw someone in the chat saying the fourth edition is coming out. Yes, it is. I'm not quite sure when either, but I'm looking forward to seeing. They, every edition has actually been really kind of, they've advanced the field quite a bit. So I'm excited to see what they have. So what do we tend to do when we hear ambivalence? Well, I think our human nature reaction is to teach or instruct or direct or convince. So we hear someone saying, ah, oh, it's not the right time. I just don't feel like I'm going to be able to do it. And we go, oh, just try it. Just go for it. It'll be fine. Or, you know, you really have to, to make something happen here. Um, or, you know, kind of moving into teaching them so that they, they think the change is more important. Something really important happens here because what we're doing is we are arguing for change when we do that. So we're giving, we're trying to elicit that change talk by arguing for change. But what research actually finds is that the opposite happens. We kind of shoot ourselves in the foot because the more that we argue for change, what do we think happens for the other person? We get the, what I call the yeah, but dance. Yeah, but mm, it's going to be too much. Or yeah, but I just think I can do it. And what we've ended up doing is eliciting the sustained talk. They're going to argue more for the reasons that they're not changing because we are arguing for the reasons to change. What's really important about this is that based on our self-perception theory, which is a theory um, that was developed back in the 60s, is that the more we hear ourselves say certain beliefs or values, the more committed to the, those values we get. So if they are talking about the status quo or not wanting to change, that technically we would anticipate them becoming more committed to those reasons. So we almost want to find a way to kind of do the opposite. We want them doing the change talking, not us. So that's what we're going to try and work on today. I'm going to go to the next slide. So how does MI work? So motivational interviewing is not an intervention. It's not a treatment. It is actually just a way of talking about change that's rather different than what, how we might be used to. Um, really paying attention to the semantics and the language of change. It's really important that when we're talking about change, we are not talking about our reasons for changing or not changing. We are completely dedicated to thinking about the other person's reasons for changing. So what we have to do, and it's really hard I know, is we have to take our own agenda and we're just going to put it up on this shelf over here, just for the time being, so that we can really immerse ourselves in what the other person is saying within an atmosphere of acceptance and compassion. Next slide. So here's where we get into what I would call, and I think Miller and Rolnick would agree with this, but kind of like the spirit of MI. So this would be how you can infuse just a conversation with someone to incorporate a little bit more of the principles of MI, and then we're going to move into some specific strategies later. So uh, we'll go to the, uh, it, they call it ORs, open-ended questions, affirming, reflecting, and summarizing. We'll go to the first, the next slide. So the first core skill is open-ended questions. Now I'm sure everyone on this call is used to doing this in conversation, um, but this is, you might not be used to doing it quite as much as what I'm gonna invite you to do. Remember your agenda is over there on the shelf. So what we're really doing is we're trying to jump into this person's shoes. Um, using open-ended questions. We know that kind of questions that end in a yes, no, like, you know, oh, are you feeling anxious about going back to work is a lot more limiting than saying, how are you feeling about going back to work? Uh, you invite their perspective without leading them in a certain 
certain place. Um, I always say that even if you have an end goal in mind, it's like the detours are so much more rich and truly motivational interviewing. There is no end goal. You are just exploring the ambivalence with the person. So these are, of course, very generic. The idea is that once you start with open-ended questions, you ask more open-ended questions uh, based on their answers. I also think it's important to know that though that you don't, it's not like closed-ended questions are off limits. I think a conversation can be a little weird if all you did was ask open-ended questions, but um, again, you really would like to focus more on the open-ended ones for, for the purpose of this. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to ask permission to talk about certain things. Would it be okay if we talked a little bit about what it's been like to get back to the workforce? Um, and then you can, I like starting with the good reasons not to change. That's kind of, I think it's always the kind of a little unexpected. So I might say, you know, how are you feeling about going back to work? What are some of the kind of the good things about not being at work right now? Like what has been kind of nice about that? Or, you know, what's that experience been like for you? And then once I get a little bit of information on that side, I might say, and any concerns about you know, being off work, has that been difficult in any way? Can you tell me more about that experience? Um, so I like to get a little bit, I like to ask lots of open-ended questions about both sides. Next slide. Here's where you get to be a little strategic. So we can also use open-ended questions to ask evocative questions that evoke change talk. You want to hear them talking about the reasons to change, their need to change, their want to change. So you can be specific. We want to hear about the sustained talk too. We want to hear about the good reasons why it's difficult. But if you can ask a little bit more about the reasons that they want to change, you get them talking more about it. So you might ask about their want to change. Uh, how would you want your life to be different in a year? Um, their ability to change. So if you decided to come back to work, how do you think you could do it? What ideas have you been coming up with? And I would really say, hypothetically, like, you know, just any ideas, like if this was the successful transition, how would you, how would you make that happen? What are some good reasons for changing? How important is this for you to do and what needs to happen? So again, this is where I'd encourage you to, to be a little strategic. Uh, and notice this isn't arguing for change. This is just evoking their own reasons for change. We'll go to the next slide. Affirmations. I think we probably underestimate how hard it is for people to be vulnerable and to talk about their ambivalence. It's often a very personal thing. And sometimes I think they worry about what it would look like to talk about ambivalence. Um, they might want to be impression management, like impression management to you. So I think just saying, I'm so glad you're talking about this with me. I'm so glad you're willing to share some of these difficult topics with me. You also might highlight their strengths. It's so, it's so clear to me that you really value your career and that it's been really tough for you to be, to be off. Um, notice how I'm using the same example. I'm not in workforce development, so I'm really curious for Lisa's part to talk about how this might specifically apply, but I'm sure you have many more examples. Uh, you're a very resourceful person. So the more you can reinforce and, and give praise, the more they might be feeling willing to open up with you and to share more specific things that they've been thinking about. Go to the next slide. Reflections. This one's a really important one. So reflective listening makes, makes a guess about what the client means. So uh, you would make a statement, not a question. So we want to be asking open-ended questions. When they give an answer, uh, we want to almost reflect back our understanding of what they've said. The easiest way to do this is to be a parrot. Uh, so if they say, I'm having a really difficult time, you can say, you're having a really difficult time. You might think that that would be a weird conversational piece and certainly don't do it for an hour in a row, but actually you'd be really shocked at how validating it is for people. Because I think people are used to getting advice or getting, you know, you know, another person's thoughts, but what you're really saying here is I'm listening to you and I'm trying to understand your perspective. If you want to go a little bit farther than that, you can also kind of, um, think about the question you want to ask and then just turn it into a statement. So you might be thinking, oh, they said going back to the workforce is going to be really tricky for them. 
I wonder what tricky means. So instead of saying, what does tricky mean? You can just say, um, it's been really tricky in going back to work because it would involve um, changing the structure of your day. You can, make a, you can make a hypothesis or you can kind of guess at something. Um, it could also be that you're, you're kind of a little bit off from what they said and so you just kind of make a statement and they will correct you. So if you've kind of gotten it wrong, they'll come back and say, no, it's not quite like that. Um, so the examples here are, you're not feeling ready to go back to work right now. So see how it's not, you're not feeling ready to go back to work right now. It's, you're not feeling ready to go back to work. You're feeling scared people will judge you because you've been out of the workforce for a while. You don't have the confidence you'll be able to keep a job once you get it. For you, getting back to a routine is gonna be really daunting. And this works like a charm. It's a lovely way of validating and hearing them out. And it's also a lovely way of collecting more data because they feel really comfortable to come up and, and ask more questions. Uh, would reframing work here? Yeah, a little bit. Again, reframing, you have to be careful. We're, we're dabbling into some like cognitive reframing where we're trying to get them to see things differently. Motivational interviewing is not about seeing things differently. It's actually about understanding their specific experience. The only thing I would say that leans towards reframing is you can say, you mentioned the word tricky. I'm curious, what does that mean? Can you actually spell it out for me? Uh, and sometimes I think when they hear themselves talk, they, well, no, it's not tricky, but it's just going to be a bit difficult to navigate. So you can use it strategically. I think whenever I say, can you describe what that means to you? It's always a lovely way of not necessarily reframing, but sometimes they reframe themselves because I've reflected it back to them and it feels a little extreme, if that makes sense. Um, you can go next. Summarizing, really important. I would give them a bit of, I would just say, hey, we've talked for a little bit. Uh, I wanna pause this here and make sure that I'm getting everything right. So on the one side, you're telling me that, you know, going back to work is gonna be really difficult. It's rearranging the structure of your day. It's challenging this piece of you that doesn't know if you're ready to tackle these types of jobs or this type of work. And on the other hand, I'm hearing that you're really feeling time for a change. You've been off for a little while. Um, you miss the part of your brain that gets that mastery sense. And so, goodness, there's both some really important stuff on both sides of the equation here. And I'm kind of feeling stuck with you. You know, I can, I can hear that this is going to be a really hard decision for you. What are we missing in that? Did I miss anything? So you can see how we're just making sure that we're capturing everything and inviting them for feedback highlighting both sides. Okay, we can go next. All right, so that's more like the spirit of motivational interviewing. This would be some specific strategies that you might wanna incorporate. So the first one we'll go, we'll go next is change rulers. Before we actually show you the rulers, I just wanna highlight that this really works because the idea is that readiness can be broken down into many different pieces. If I'm feeling ready to make a change in my life, um, it usually means that I feel like the change is important to me in some way. And it also would probably means that I'm feeling confident that if I were to try and make the change that I would be somewhat successful. So readiness is kind of, it's got a couple different pieces. And so we'll go to the next slide. If you can identify what pieces are they're stuck on, it means that you can more effectively tailor some of the conversations to those pieces. So um, in my master's, we used motivational interviewing to uh, look at people who had undergone a certain type of surgery to see how ready they were to follow the guidelines. And what we found was that they felt the, that following the guidelines after surgery was super important to them. It was just that they didn't think they could do it. So for us, that was so important because we then don't have to educate or teach like they know it's important. It's more about how do we increase their self-efficacy to be able to make some of these changes. So these, this is a great tool to help you and the person you're talking to kind of assess where they're at with being ready. It's got a, here it's got willingness, confidence, and readiness. I love, instead of willingness, putting it as like an importance ruler. But again, you can put whatever you want here, honestly. So let's take the confidence ruler, for example. How we, you would introduce this is just to say, okay, so let's, maybe we can get a snapshot of where things are for you right now, now that we've talked about it a little bit. 
So from zero to 10, um, zero being not at all ready, not at all confident that if you made this change, you could follow through with it. 10 being, yeah, if I made this change tomorrow, no problem. I could, I could implement it and be really confident that I could do it. Um, then where would you put yourself right now? Uh, and so let's say they pick a four. Immediately, what are we feeling? Oh, it's not going to happen. They're not feeling confident. Again, immediately, it's to look at, oh, they're not at a 10. They're not ready to do it. As opposed to the MI lens is very much a four. Wow, that is higher than a zero. There's got to be something there that's leading them to feel somewhat confident that they can do this. Now, remember, if I'm spending my time thinking about why they're not at a 10 and talking to them about that, what type of talk is that going to elicit? It's going to be that sustained talk. Oh, why isn't it a six? Well, I just, I've tried to change before and it didn't work out. That's the sustained talk. The more they hear themselves talking about the reasons not to change, the more committed they're going to be. So we want to do the opposite. What makes it a four and not a three? Well, you know, I, I, I think I'm decently persistent at things and can really work on, on this. And probably if I, I don't hear people say this all the time, if I started, I'd probably start to feel more confident. And I'm like, isn't that interesting? So then what does it mean? Like, what would it take to get you from a four to a five? Well, I probably have to just start. So that's a lovely way. So why is it this number and not a lower number? And then what can we do to move the needle up a little bit? Now, you might be thinking, what if it's at a zero? Um, usually I kind of go, you're here for something. You're here in front of me for something. What do you think that's about? Um, yeah, willingness and, and readiness. Again, I, I think there's just slight nuances. To me, willingness captures a little bit more of that importance factor that I'm willing to do this because it's worth the trade-off to me, that there's something in it for me. Um, but again, I like, I like putting importance ruler, confidence ruler, and readiness ruler. Those are my three favorites. Um, so then you can use one of these rulers, all of them, whatever makes sense for you, but it's a lovely way of capturing where they're at right now and also getting a little bit of the change talk in. All right, we'll go to the next slide. Decisional balance. If, if anyone here has heard of MI, this might be the, the poster, the, the face of MI. This is a really accessible tool for many people. What I love it is it's not like something I have to have in my back pocket. It's literally just dividing a piece of paper into quadrants and saying, good things, not so good things, changing and not changing. So I love to, to kind of invite them to do this. If I feel like we've got lots of interesting stuff on both sides, they would write it. Um, so you're not swooping in and writing this for them. I think it's so powerful when they have the pen and they're writing it down. Keep in mind also your body language here. So if I'm holding the clipboard and writing over here and there's a desk between you and the person you're talking to, you can feel the power imbalance a little bit more than if I were to roll my chair up beside them or to the corner of the desk and kind of meet them halfway and pass them the pen. Again, it shows that I want to hear from them about what's going on as opposed to that kind of stance that like I know what's happening or should happen. So keep in mind your body language, your vocal tone, stuff like that. But what we're really doing here is you're inviting them to think about the good things and not so good things about staying the same and the good things and not so good things about making a change. And again, you can use pros, cons. I love saying good things and not so good things because it feels very accessible and not super black and white, I suppose. Um, you might be thinking, well, isn't it gonna be the same things on the opposing quadrants? Like the downside of not changing will have a lot of overlap with the good things about making a change. But actually, what we find is that there's really rich new information in each of the quadrants that, that it's important to pay attention to. Um, we, again, you can use the spirit of MMI in when you're doing this. So again, lots of open-ended questions. I'm aware that when I'm talking about the not so good things about not changing, that again, I'm being a bit more strategic when they say, you know, not so good things is, you know, I'm not making as much money. I'll say, what kind of things would you like? to be doing with extra money if you had it. So notice that they've already given me a good answer, but I'm going, I wanna hear a bit of change talk. So I'm gonna ask an open-ended question uh, to get at more of that information. And if they say, oh, that'd be just be so great to take a family trip. 
oh, where do you think you might want to go? And what would that do for your family? Um, again, I'm not ignoring the other quadrants, but I can be a little strategic if I need to. It's really important, though, that when you're talking about the good things about not changing is that there's no judgment. There's no, oh, that's not such a good reason. Or I wonder if that even counts. We're writing things down where the, where the person wants to put it. And we're being really, again, the more that you can get on the side of like, that really makes sense to me, the less, the more disarmed they will be, the less defensive and the, the less of a need they'll have to argue their point of view. Um, so this is a great one to have on hand. That is it for me. So I'm really excited to hear from Lisa about how we might be applying these more specifically to the area that you're all in. And then we'll get some questions afterwards. Thank you very much, Dr. Lauren. That was awesome. So I hope uh, not to repeat too much, um, but first I'll just reintroduce myself. Uh, my name is Lisa Ambai and I am the Executive Director of the Rideau Ottawa Valley Learning Network, which is situated in Ottawa. I'm going to take a look at is the current state of affairs, uh, how motivational interviewing can be used with uh, within employment services and within uh, adult training and learning. And so just a couple of stats here just to help give the context um, why I was interested in looking at motivational interviewing for these two particular services um, was because we have um, a lot of adults coming into adult learning and within a few weeks leaving and consuming a lot of resources and uh, the organization's time. And also that the uh, clients that have uh, chronic unemployment and face multiple barriers are the most challenging to um, employment services and require a, a lot of time. And with the transformation that we're going through here in Ontario, um, it, it is you know, really important that we are working with adults in an appropriate way. And very often though, I do hear that the blame is put on to the learner or the client that they were just not motivated enough. And so I, what I thought I would do is take a different approach and talk about myths of motivation so that you can see how we as practitioners can actually use motivational interviewing to help support clients through their change journey. So first I'll take a look at motivation, which is unaffected by the way we operate. That's a myth, you know, um, they come, clients and learners come in and they're motivated. Um, and so whatever we do doesn't affect their motivation. Um, the next one is motivation is dichotomous, that you're either or, um, either motivated or not motivated. And then, um, whoops, sorry. Can't see my other one. Sorry, I'm just moving this down. Um, motivating adults can be spontaneous. So the thought is that um, it's much more authentic if I'm spontaneous with my, my uh, use of motivational interviewing. And then the last one is that it's optional. So um, looking at the first one, I want to talk about the writing reflex. Uh, Dr. Lauren, I'm not. I, didn't see whether you had mentioned that, but those of us who are drawn into social services tend to have a lot of the writing reflex, which is this uh, really powerful emotion that when we see someone who is in pain or in hardship, that we want to help fix the problem. And it, you know, we're drawn into this, not because we're going to end up buying, you know, mansions and and you know the, the most expensive cars and TVs and et cetera. It's because we have this innate need in order to help others. And sometimes that can come in and actually um, kind of derail our efforts to help people in their journey uh, to employment or to adult literacy. And I'll tell you why. Because um, very often with our expertise and our experience in 
adult literacy or employment services, we develop a lot of tools, we develop a lot of credentials, and we have a lot of experience and we see the fastest and mo most incremental um, journey to the person's goal. And, and we see it as a linear pathway and we want to help that person get there. So we, um, our writing reflex takes over and we start to make a lot of suggestions. And we ask a lot of quote closed questions because we're really just reaffirming what it is we know about employment and how the, the quickest way to get into a job is, is by doing X, Y, and Z. And so when, we're, when we have a new person in front of us, we're asking a lot of these standard questions and these closed questions because we're trying to affirm whether or not this person fits the typical pattern. And then we get into the if only. So if only you would um, brush up your resume, if only you would practice your interview skills, if only you get into um, one of our workshops, then you would get a job. Or if only you um, were able to study an hour each night, uh, you would have your skills upgraded by the time you know we sit together next month. So those kinds of things are not bad. And you know, it's just a, a really um, important way for us to check in with ourselves that we're doing this suggestive coaching and that um, our actions can actually um, quell someone's motivation because we're sort of um, stepping over the line where, where um, we're, we're wanting to change more as Dr. Lauren had said, than the person we're, we're reinforcing that change talk. So. Sometimes it happens in, in our coaching because we are so limited in time. Some places only have a half an hour appointment with an individual. And so, the, you know, as an, a counselor, you're really trying to get through uh, the appointment with some success at the end. And sometimes we have to slow down in order to speed up later. And uh, so the, the downside of that kind of approach is that the success comes from those individuals who are willing to implement our suggestions and not necessarily those individuals who really need our support. So there's the, the myth that the individuals who are ready to go and already, you know, just tell me what it is I, I need to do and I will get going. Those are the individuals that see the most success. And that reinforces our own kind of approach of like, okay, well, it worked for that person, so it should work for everybody, when in actuality, we have to look at each individual as unique and bringing um, a whole gamut of different situations. But again, you know, in, in our world of employment services and literacy, um, sometimes it's the time, it's the timing that we have with an individual. We, we don't have as much time as we would like. Having said that, um, doctors are using MI very, very quickly. We all know that we have very limited time with the doctor. So they often say you can only bring one, one um, problem into the appointment. And so they're able to quickly uh, use motivational interviewing questioning techniques in order to have the person come to a conclusion on their own. And the appointment is very successful, even though it is in a very short time. So it's possible to be uh, using MI, even if we do have a short amount of time with individuals. What tends to happen though, when, when we are more over the line, uh, as Dr. Lauren had said, is that we, we kind of get into this sort of car salesman, um, vacuum salesperson kind of uh, approach. And we get into persuasion and you know trying to, get the person to sort of see that incremental path that's linear and and what and it tends to happen is the person's ego gets kind of razzed like as if we take some sandpaper and we're rubbing it against their ego and the person feels threatened and so after that happens it becomes much more of um, a conversation where the person is arguing against change, against going to adult literacy, against getting employment. And that is off, very counterintuitive to what we want to happen. So what if we were then to look at uh, change 
um, in regards to employment and adult literacy. It is change. Learning is change. We grow, we develop new neural pathways, um, we expand our horizons, we're out of our comfort zone. The same can be said for employment. For someone who has been chronically unemployed, then it is a uh, it's change. It's change, as Dr. Lauren had pointed out, in a routine where a person has been at home, and then it's a change in, in the whole um, behaviors, even waking up in the morning and uh, being on time, thinking and planning about how you're going to get from A to B on time, what needs to happen in between in order to get prepared, is a whole bunch of small changes that all manifest into one huge change, which for many people can seem completely overwhelming. So what do we do as employment counselors? We see uh, employment as a destination and what we need to start thinking about it as is a whole incremental bunch of changes. Same for literacy is thinking about not just showing up to the class and then learning something, it, it's about breaking it into smaller changes. And one way that we can do that is um, to really think about, you know, what are some, if I were to, to take the bar and put it really low um, and ask the person themselves, what do they think is the first step? What is the first thing that we can do uh, in order to uh, think about employment or think about learning what's what's one of the you know just one thing that we can accomplish today because we're not pushing the person to think about the end goal um, as a sort of linear destination we're thinking about what steps can i get the person um, you know how can i help them to see this as doable as achievable and so although i may have uh, an idea of what the first step is resume let's get that resume or let's you know sign you up for this this uh this course that person's idea and notion of change may be very different than my own so i have to accept what that person brings to the table and we work on that together and it could be the the golden change that that speeds things up i don't know but i need to go where that person leads me So this is, uh, you know, again, we we hear often very that that change is very very difficult, and that sustain is that the devil that you know, um, and people uh, often say, well, you know, if only they could remember, if only, um, if only they could go come to adult literacy. If I just get them in the door, then I know they're going to love it and everything, but it is it is difficult. To, to consider um, something that it brings in fear. And, and so one of the emotions that we really have to think about when we're working with clients that have multiple barriers is that we're evoking some fear when we're trying to bring somebody to uh, accept or consider change. And, um, and so we may often um, have to like take a look at what are those barriers that the person is bringing to the table, uh, whether it's a person living in poverty, whether it's a person who has um, not completed high school, uh, perhaps institutional barriers that we ourselves have. We have a registration form that needs to be completed and it's really long and arduous. Um, maybe the location is far from where they live and so it requires bus tickets and everything and then dispositional barriers these are the the hardest ones to see because they're often the ones that are uh, internally this the negative self-talk that a person is telling themselves it could be also the the voices that people have said about them you know you're good for nothing uh you, you think you could get a job or do you think you could get a high school diploma um, and those voices are continuously going around in the person's head. When we have all of these different barriers uh, that the person is dealing with, very often they cannot see change as a possibility. And a tool that I like to use, very simple, is just draw a bunch of circles on a piece of paper and say, what are some of the things that you think we need to address before you can think of 
coming to adult literacy or before you can think of, of like going to employment services. And so that is um, a collaborative way to sort of address those barriers that might be holding the person back. And, and as you build trust, then those uh, things can um, come out in, in an appointment that you wouldn't expect. So I was told when I was a kid that I wasn't smart. And so school for me is very stressful. Okay, can we add that to our bubble list? And, um, and when you tackle one of those, whether it be through a referral to an agency that can support the person with housing or bus tickets, we can cross those off. And as we're crossing off those, those different barriers, then, um, then the person can feel lightened, um, less negative self-talk, less issues that they're carrying on their shoulder, and more free to start thinking about change. And so that's one of the tools that, uh, that I really like to use. And it's very simple. Just draw a bunch of circles on a piece of paper. And as you tackle those different things, you can cross them off. Um, once again, thinking again that change is not uh, an event, that employment is sort of our end goal as, as employment consultants, and uh, that upgrading someone's skills as a literacy practitioner is our, our end goal, but it's a process. And so if we think about what uh, the person needs in order to approach change, then uh, we can certainly help them along in a different manner. The second myth is that motivational um, motivation is dichotomous. So it's either or a person is or is not. And what I want you to do is to think about the fact that everyone has a small flame, that um, how big or how small it is, it depends on external factors, like the situation, situational barriers, the institutional and the dispositional barriers. And if you think of yourself as the person with the fan that is going to like stoke that, that internal flame um, for change um, and, and burn off their eyebrows and their bangs, um, one day because you've stoked that flame so incredibly hot that uh, that one day you don't see them anymore because they're off on their journey. They're off uh, getting the job or they're off, um, you know, fulfilling their educational uh, pathway. And that uh, because it's not linear, some days someone could be in action stage and slip back down into contemplation. And it, and it all depends on, on the, what's going on in the person's mind, um, whether they have slipped back into sustain and, and uh, are feeling maybe particularly vulnerable. Um, but you know the fact is that it's not a line. It, uh, and it could be even a circle um, because people tend to move back and forth in the stages of change and not to think of like uh, a person as not motivated but perhaps dealing with something external. Okay, why isn't it changing? Oops, okay. So I just wanted to just touch on something that Dr. Lauren had said that uh, it's a relational um, component of MI that's more than just a conversation that we're really de developing this person-centered approach. And uh, so just a couple of slides to think about always compassion when you're working with uh, individuals, particularly multiple barrier clients, that uh, we think of it as a partnership in a dance. Um, we have knowledge of the dance that we can guide the person through um, their journey in, in education or employment. And that uh, we're also accepting who they are um, meeting them with accurate empathy, absolute worth that uh, everyone deserves a job. If you have that mindset, everyone deserves education. Your approach completely changes um, with ever who you are interacting with. And then affirmations as Dr. Lauren has mentioned. Um, we want to evoke um, from the person, their motivations for change. So, you know, asking them each and every appointment, 
Um, remind me what it is that brought you into adult literacy. Like, what was it again that you wanted to do? Because hearing it more often helps the person to concretize it in their in their soul, in their in their mind, and uh, really keeps that motivation, that flame, you know, burning really hot. Um, and very often, you know, we can we can reinforce that by saying, "Hey, I noticed um, your homework wasn't done today, and I wondered um, if there was some issue with like, have you reevaluated what your motivation was for for coming here? Uh, are you still interested in reading a bedtime story to your grandchild? Awesome, let's keep going." Um, whoops. And then oh, there is the technical component, and we're always trying to respond. We're trying to elicit and we're trying to recognize change talk. I'm sorry, I keep flipping. <laughs> um, and that, you know, using our oars, um, you can't go wrong. You, you don't think that there is um, this science that you're not able to do it. Um, using the open-ended questions is great. Tell me more and affirming their uh, beliefs and values is really important. And it actually is, and I hope I get through all my slides, it really is the, um, the one um, uh, of the oars or the skills that actually has uh, the, the greatest impact because we are very starved in society for affirmations, for people to recognize when we are working very hard. And if you think about the, the pathways into employment, that's a really hard journey for people. And so using affirmations really fans that flame and keeps the person um, motivated and also appreciative of their efforts, you know, that, that other people are noticing how hard they are working. A couple of samples of questions that can help elicit those values and, um, and also the, uh, the reasons for change and, and help you as a, practitioner to draw that person towards what whatever their goal might be by reminding them and using their their big thoughts and the reasons for accessing adult literacy and employment services. And always to uh, try to put yourselves in the shoes of the individual. Um, really, to, that's the empathy component of it that we are compassionate because we're drawn to working in these services. Empathy is drawing out the emotions in yourself and remembering what it was like to start a new job, remembering in yourself what it was like to learn something new and to uh, meet the person on the same level as they're going through that, that difficult and challenging change um, to, to remember and be sensitive to how you feel um, and then and to, to think of like how that person might also be feeling. So the third one is uh, can be spontaneous. And the reality is that we really need to be conscious and be more conscientious of using um, uh, you know, all our motivational interviewing techniques uh, to create climates and opportunities for the person to feel hopeful. Oops, I'm so sorry. And that um, we really are not trying to, to look at the person's deficits, but actually looking for their strengths. And that creates a really good climate for hope. And the last one is that motivating clients is optional. And uh, the myth is not true. Uh, we really do have to be conscious about it. And so whether we are affirming, as I mentioned, is one of the strongest motivators um, and it has the most impact in helping someone to move in change is to pick out something that is timely, um, valid and real. Try not to do group. If you're, if you're doing a workshop or something, try to pick out something that an individual did in order to validate their strengths and the, and the resources that they have within or the efforts that they have put forward. Um, because it really does have an impact. Um, we can think of, you know, just empathize with, with yourself uh, when you've had some praise and, um, or you've had some affirmations and how good you felt about 
having someone recognize what you have done. And uh, just imagine how uh, clients and learners will feel when you authentically uh, note something that they have done towards change and uh, make a point of, of talking to them about it. It's just wonderful and uh, can really, really get that flame going. <laughs> So thank you very much and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. And I think we have like four minutes for questions. <laughs> thank you so much, Lisa and Lauren. Uh, unfortunately, we won't have time for question and answer during the live session, but we will take questions for sure. Please share your questions in the chat box and we will uh, address them after the presentation. But for now, I'm really, wow, what wonderful presentation. Thank you both, uh, Lisa and Lauren, for delivering such an engaging session with over 200 attendees from across Canada. And for now, uh, I really appreciate everyone taking a couple of minutes to answer a brief poll questions on the resources and topics um, that uh, was shared with you during this presentation. And uh, the, the um, the results of this uh, will really uh, uh, help us in forming and framing our future activities. So I'd really appreciate if you take the time to take uh, the poll questions. And also, I appreciate if you could consider signing up to our community practice newsletter, which the link is shared in the chat box and the QR code is shared on the screen uh, to learn more about uh, what we do uh, and our upcoming events. So, yeah, while everyone is uh, answering the poll questions and also if you like uh, registering for our newsletter I really want to thank everyone both the attendee all the attendees that uh, took the time to attend today's session really really interesting um, webinar and thank you our speakers for sharing the wisdom and practical guidances that are not only applicable to our workplaces but also to our everyday lives thank you very much <laughs>